Hey, dear listeners, this is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. Very excited, long time waiting to do this podcast, because every time, not every time, but almost every time I go uh, to the office at AEI, I bump into today's guest, and um, I ask him, I've asked him the cruelest words <laughs> you can ever ask an author, which is either, how's the book going, or is the book done yet? And um, it's the only thing that I think it's kind of like with with military vets, they can ask kind of cruel questions of other military vets that you would never dare ask as a civilian who's never served. But um, because being asked, is the book done yet, is a viciously cruel question to people working on a book. But it is done. It is out. And that is why we have my AI colleague, Tim Carney. Um, here on The Remnant to talk about family unfriendly, how our culture made raising kids much harder than it needs to be. Now, Tim, I got to tell you something. I didn't, I cut you off when we were talking before we started recording because I want to get this record. I want to get this on tape. You're originally from New York. Yes. I'm originally from New York. We come from a certain kind of uh, uh, tribals too strong. But like a, we have a certain love for the the ethnic tongs of of old New York kind of thing, and we both come from the right side of the political aisle. You're you've always been. A, we can talk about it more in a minute. Uh, a little harder to label than I think I've been, but so be it. Uh, when I saw Al Sharpton <laughs> tweet a clip. On Twitter, from his account, boasting of his conversation with you, um, I wanted to go back in a time machine <laughs> and show it to a young Tim Carney and say, this is the life you're choosing. Um, anyway, welcome to The Remnant. Uh, take that anywhere you want to go. Thank you. So yeah, so uh, Morning Joe had me on when the when the book came out the other day. And so Joe and Mika are asking me questions about family, about, you know, travel sports, about religiosity and the decline in community in the U.S. And when you're on TV, Jonah, you know, some of your listeners may not. A lot of times you're just in this little black closet and mm -hmm. there's nothing warm or welcoming about it. You're staring at a camera where the lights, you can barely see the lens and you're pretending that you're looking at people, but you don't really know who's talking to you. Now, you know, I know Joe Scarborough. I know Mika. I, I, I know where their questions were coming from. But all of a sudden in my little earpiece comes a voice from 1988. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Al Sharpton. Now, again, I'm from Manhattan, so I he was a big background figure when I was little until the Tawana Brawley episode, right? Yeah, yeah. And so then he at, proceeds to ask the best question I got I that whole opening day, all of Monday, basically. And he asked, he said, when I was growing I'm not going to try to do my Al Sharpton voice. I don't know if you can do one. But he said, when I was growing up in Brooklyn and we were in church – there was sort of a, a generational continuity that we were inheriting something from our parents and passing it down to kids. And do smartphones make people lose that continuity? And so the kids don't, they don't have that. And I thought that's absolutely brilliant. So again, it's, I would not have imagined 20, 30 something years ago that that's where question. I would have been. Yes. Yeah. Right, and so I, imagine I, being my brothers. My, the Carney brothers were all watching it, and they were even more <laughs> caught off guard that Al Sharpton came in because he was just piped in from nowhere. I know this is a Simpsons esque, grotesque, almost bigoted stereotype, but because it was seven something <laughs> in the morning. And but the day I, after St. Patrick's Day, I yes. picture a bunch of Carney brothers. <laughs> At an Irish bar, <laughs> spitting out their beer <laughs> when they see this happen. Um, but uh, and I know that's not what happened anyway. But um, all right, so I have violated the first rule of of uh, this podcast when it comes to authors coming on with books. Is I, I'm supposed to ask because it's a question I always want to get on a book tour. What's your book about? I think it's kind of in the title, but like expand on. Yes. So childhood 
anxiety is at a record high. It's an epidemic. You've got parents are stressed and the birth rate is at record low. So we're the total fertility rate, women, uh, children per women is down to 1.7, 1.6. The number of babies born has gone down almost every year for the last 15 years. And so a lot of people say, well, this just is because you can't afford kids. That's the number one answer you get. And then other people, when you ask would-be grandparents why they don't have grandkids yet, a lot of them say, oh, well, you know, the, the, the kids today are too selfish. And I don't accept either of those for reasons we can talk about. My argument is that there's a cultural problem that's making it harder to have kids. The, the desired family size still is 2.7 kids, and we're getting 1.6 to 1.7. That's an average. Not, right. not most people aren't saying 2.7. It's averaging up to that. And so then you get, so my argument is that in all sorts of ways, our culture is family unfriendly. And so start with parenting culture is just, it's way too, it's, it's wild that we replace local little league with intensive, expensive travel sports. Mom and dad are expected to helicopter little Connor to make sure he never skins his knee. Dating and mating culture is totally dysfunctional. Thanks mostly to the apps, but also some of the, the sociological changes Reverend Al was referring to. And our families, our, our culture's values are family unfriendly too, in that we are too materialistic. We worship autonomy as a, as a god. It's the only sort of unquestionable good in, in modern psyche. You, you've got the idea of commitment is, be, is antagonistic to the idea of, of autonomy. And all of the values point against the idea of getting married, settling down, and having kids. And modern feminism has become this sort of workist nightmare that, that rejects the idea of giving up your life and, and getting together with another person, whether it be your, your spouse, your kid, etc. So I'm trying to say it is harder to raise kids today, but it's not because people are worse or the economy is worse, but because our culture doesn't do the support of families and the pointing people towards family that it traditionally has done. Yeah, and, and we should be clear, like, when you say culture, I mean, you mean largely culture, but also culture in the broadest sense, because there are tax policies, there are, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost our civilization has a problem, because it's not just in America, too. I mean, I know you focus on America, but yeah. I just saw the numbers I literally this morning that just in the last two years, Germany's birth rate, which was already trending low, dropped by like went from like 1.6 to 1.4 just the last two years or something like that it's it's like almost in free fall and um so it's funny like I, I think you know this about me i am not particularly enamored with the post-liberal integralist yes. theory about western civilization and whatnot but one of the places where i have some sympathy for it um because i'm a conservative is um this point you make about feminism basically wanting the, I use this somewhat ironically, neoliberal late capitalist male model <laughs> yes. of, of labor and thinks that real feminine, real female equality can only be achieved by mimicking the sort of gray, man in the gray flannel suit version of, of male accomplishment. And I am very sympathetic to that argument. I mean, there's, it seems to me like, you could make the we would we would be better off as a society if the feminists had won the earlier feminists the essential feminists whatever what label we want to call them mm -hmm. had successfully convinced more men to have a more maternalistic view <laughs> of family and community rather well, than the other way around so why don't we so, so, so expand on all that so um so a term i encountered was um uh gender symmetry feminism which mm -hmm. is about eradicating basically all differences. But the the sort of one term that I came up with counter to that was what I called bathroom feminism. I, there was this time I was talking to this feminist activist at the United Nations interviewing her. And, you know, she seemed totally radical and extreme in all sorts of ways. And then she lodged this complaint against the United Nations that was interesting to me. She said, if you look at the floor plan around the General Assembly, you can tell it was made by a man because the women's bathroom is the same size and square footage and layout as a men's bathroom, just with some of the urinals replaced with stalls. And I thought, what does this have to do with anything? And then she just 
explained. You can fit fewer sort of urinals per, I mean, more urinals per square foot, fewer stalls. Women take longer. So there's this long line coming out of the ladies' room at every break and this short line coming out of the men's room. And then suddenly I realized that that was the sort of feminist I was. Some dude didn't take into account that women were different. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a, a background argument I put in there. But on the work front, the way I put it is instead of that a lot of feminism today tries to turn women into company men, I think a better feminism would try to turn company men into family guys mm -hmm, and not, mm -hmm. in, not into male moms, but into sort of dads who even in the workplace are loud and expressive about their dads. And so on, and I do it on Twitter and you get made fun of if you talk uh, if, glowingly about your, your wife and your husband and your, and your kids on Twitter. I mean, I don't know if women get made fun of if they talk about their husband, but men, we get called wife guys. Um, <laughs> and so, and I decided that that, that was a good thing. Um, if people were going to make fun of me for being too obsequious, it, that was probably good. And so I put, I put suburban dad in my bio, just try to lead with that. Now, again, it's not the same as being more maternal because mm -hmm. another thing that I, I think we need to focus on is dadding is a different thing. And probably, mm -hmm. in my opinion, a more fun thing than than momming. I take my three boys out and play and beat them in basketball whenever I can. The one who's slightly taller than me, I can barely beat him. The one who's uh, nine years old, I demolish him. I can't. I can't. I can't <laughs> literally. Must be so proud. <laughs> I can't literally dunk <laughs> on him, but I just swat his shots left and right. Uh -huh. And it's so much fun. It's fun for them. It's fun for me. And that's a kind of image of masculinity that needs to be out there. But then in the workplace, it has to be in there. So in the later chapters, I talk about a family-friendly workplace, and the it's about. I'm pushing back on this idea that the the way to get equality is more just subsidize the heck out of daycare mm -hmm. because that's about saying, well, the problem is that women are trying to or want flexibility. And so they really need to take care of their kids. And that's what's holding them back. And my argument is, well, then the women are doing it right. And the men should want flexibility, too. And so that family friendly feminism that I lay out is an idea that in the workplace, men should be just proudly saying, you know, I got to leave at four o'clock every Friday because I'm coaching T-ball. Mm -hmm. um, so what was your answer to Al Sharpton? About, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm legitimately curious. I, I told him that he has to, uh, that the, his ideal would be the Jews. In, in Israel, there's absolutely this idea. So Israel has a 3.0 birth rate. Europe is 1.5. Mm -hmm. Secular Jews even are 2.0. And I interviewed this man uh, in, on the streets of Tel Aviv. I went to Tel Aviv specifically to find secular Jews. He's pushing his two kids in the stroller while the baby and, and mom are napping. And he tells me, God has nothing to do with our family planning. But then later on, he says, you have to keep the tribe going. And that notion of inheriting something from your parents and passing it down to your children. I think that's lost in the modern mindset a lot, especially in America, where like on the left, the idea that in inheriting something can be good. <laughs> that's lost because it's either right. your parents imposing on you or it's you're handed a privilege that you didn't deserve. But in Israel and uh, more observant Jewish communities in the, in the U.S., that's certainly a thing that when you get handed something, you appreciate it and you have a duty to take care of it and pass it down. So cultural inheritance. So I said, yes, cultural inheritance is exactly a thing that's lost and that the, the social media, the, the, the message of those media is to isolate you and to disentangle you from uh, previous generations. Something I remember doing one of these podcasts yesterday was how many of our colleagues, DC or New York journalists, sort of pride themselves on uprooting themselves from their family, that they're mm. starting everything anew. They're not inheriting something. So Reverend Al, growing up in the black church in Brooklyn, it was very clear that he inherited something. And it was very clear in that, uh, in that world that you are supposed to be passing it down, that cultural inheritance is valuable, real, and an obligation and a privilege. Yeah. And so I mean, what I keep thinking about is, you know, which was a big theme in my last book, um, Suicide of the West, which I, you know, 
I am indebted to our our boss, Yuval Levin, for um, um, which was this conception of conservatism as gratitude, mm-hmm. right? This idea that, um, and I, I really do think it's 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 a small C conservatism as much as it's a big C conservatism because I think this is something that you can be left of center ideologically on all sorts of role of government kind of things. But this is something that, you know, like many, I don't know if you know this about Jews, but many of them are. Um, and yet they still have this, <laughs> uh, this small C conservatism that says you should be grateful for your family. You should be grateful for what you've inherited. You should be grateful for what you have around you. Um, and you look at the things, you look at the things in your life around you that you think are lovely and deserving of love and gratitude. And because you're grateful for them, you want to pass them on, uh, preserve them, right? It doesn't even have to be passed them on to your children, but pass them on to a next generation more broadly. And, yep. um, and the problem with our culture today is we teach people the opposite of gratitude. We teach them a sense of entitlement. We sense them, teach them a sense of grievance based upon simply the circumstances of their birth. And, um, but also being past something is it's it's an unchosen thing, right? Like if right. somebody and so the it brings unchosen privileges and unchosen and undeserved privileges and unchosen obligations. That's something that really clashes with the modern mind. And that's one of the things I really try to get into in the later chapters. It's not surprising that on your show we skip like the easy beginning stuff. I try to start with like travel sports or crazy. Am I right? And then, and <laughs> we, then we work, get to that stuff. And then work myself, work the reader up to your unchosen obligations are actually, they define who you are. Or as Casey yeah, Affleck yeah. put it in, in uh, Gone Baby Gone, I always thought it was the things we didn't choose that make you who you are. And so, <laughs> uh, but that idea that the unchosen obligation is a good thing, that is what so much of the modern elite spirit is arguing against when you read the monthly new york times op-ed in favor of divorce it's somebody slowly coming to realize wait a second once i was in this marriage i no longer uh so much of my life was not consensual it was just sort of written for me and i had instead to break free of that and be free to write my life script line by line on a blank page with none of it filled out for me so that mindset, which is not brand new to the era, obviously. I mean, I think this is some of what Rousseau was talking about. But mm-hmm. it, it's 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 newish that it's so unthinkingly adopted as a, as a good thing. That is the ultimate family unfriendly aspect of our culture. Is that spirit, that autonomy, and and being a, a self created self is the the real good. Yeah, I mean, the phrase uh, I agree. It goes back to Rousseau. It's very romantic. This idea that the inner lamp of meaning is the only thing that matters, right? Um, uh, and it's, um, but the phrase that I, I, I now love and think about all the time, which I, I gather started on Instagram or one of these places, is main character syndrome, where <laughs> people think that they see their life as a movie and they think they're the main character. And so the other characters can fall off or be instrumental or whatever. And, um, I remember a couple of years ago, Steven Spielberg gave an interview where he admitted how basically ashamed he was of how he wrote the Richard Dreyfus character in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Because mm-hmm. Richard Dreyfus really doesn't think twice about abandoning Terry Garr and a bunch of little kids to go look for aliens. And, <laughs> and, um, and, Spielberg was like, look, I was a young man back then and I had this different understanding. I didn't really appreciate family and all that. I would never have written that that way today. But that 1970s Kramer versus Kramer, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Close Encounters kind of thing. It is weird how deeply instantiated that is in a certain brand of basically of New York Times op-ed page, New York Magazine, elite liberalism. And, um, but at the same time, I mean, as you pointed out with the birth rates, it feels like it's it's not just, you know, the cosmopolitans of New York City and L.A. that think this way, because if if more people didn't, if, if the rest of the country didn't think this way, the birth rates would be higher and family and family formation would be in much better shape. So 
one and one of the arguments I make that this is a cultural rather than primarily economic or or policy matter is that it the the collapse in the birth rates as well as the childhood anxiety have trickled down from the upper class to the middle class, and that's what cultural trends tend to do. And so, but at the same time, I would make I make this. I'd make the same sort of argument I made in Alienated America about the collapse of community that it, it definitely manifests itself different in the working class. The working class collapse in the birth rates, the sort of proximate causes are a lack of stable marriage and a lack of stable community. And in the elite classes, it's going to be this worship of autonomy as well as the over ambitious uh, parenting, the helicopter parenting, the the intensive parenting, those things are going to shrink families, make parenting seem more daunting to a lot of people. Those ideas, though, too, are trickling down to the middle class. We conducted a uh, AI helped us conduct a focus group of single of single and married men, single and married women who didn't have children and were undecided or against having children. And the undecided guys, most of them just said, I just don't want to give my kids the bare minimum. I want to give them the best of everything. And I, you know, you should want to give your kids the best of everything if it means, you know, love and, and support and all that stuff. But if it means the best possible lacrosse team, no. Right. right. Um, but that is an idea that's trickling down uh, from the upper class. So to some extent, the working class baby bus is a different story, but a lot of it is, again, that idea. And the idea that of accepting, part of being a dad often is accepting a job that's not a ton of fun, and but pays the bills. I don't go on at length about that because I don't have credibility because I have a super fun job, but that mm -hmm. is part of being a job. And that is another thing that the working class is increasingly saying, no, it really needs to be a calling for me. For me, mm -hmm. my calling is being a dad. I right. Got, and th that idea that your job should be a calling and provide you satisfaction, that has trickled down from the elites to the working class in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, we're both lucky. The life we've chosen, we're pretty well suited for. Otherwise, we <laughs> would have gotten out of it a long time ago. Um, and I do, when I give advice to people, I do say, like, you should not find a job in life that you hate, right? If mm -hmm. you can avoid it. But you don't have to necessarily love it, right? Because, I mean, there's some people whose identity is their job, and there's some people for whom their job is the thing that funds their identity. Mm -hmm. And I'm increasingly more in favor of multiple identities. I, I don't mean, like, multiple personalities. Yeah. <laughs> I just, you have different roles in different institutions. In some institutions, you're a follower, and some, you're a leader, and some, you're, you know... Um, uh, somewhere have in between. Have you noticed how all our conversations just become footnotes to Yuval Levin? Pretty much. Point? It's really kind of disturbing. <laughs> um, and uh, um, at some point, we're just going to have to burn him as a witch. But um, uh, I do want to. So, so you are um, a dues paying member in good standing of the Two Thumbs Up for Capitalism Club, mm -hmm. as, as am I. Um, and I agree with you that there's the culture problem that you're talking about is not necessarily um, doesn't that's automatically or necessarily flow from the free market, right? Free market cultures, there are a lot of free market cultures uh -huh. that have different cultures, I mean, they're still free market. That said, you know, Lyman Stone, who I, I know you know, um, one of the arguments that he makes is not the traditional Patrick Deneen mm -hmm. capitalism is bad for families argument uh, because of its view of, of deracinated automata, automatons and homo economicus. His argument is, in part, I don't want to be unfair to him, but in part, free market creates a lot of really cool stuff, and that distracts us. And so he finds like birth rates for people who have access to really good beach, you know, proximity to really good beach vacations um, <laughs> is lower than places where it's not. Right. And um, is is the multiplicity of choice and options that comes from a free market society uh, 
the general prosperity is that making things a little harder for uh family formation and having kids well so actually i'll start by answering with something that's kind of between lyman stone and patrick denine probably uh -huh. which is that and we've let the logic of capitalism seep into our social arrangements and mm -hmm. that's a problem that you don't just as you don't run your home as a democracy <laughs> right <laughs> parents run it as you know as a, a, a duarchy um but the you shouldn't your social arrangements shouldn't be run capitalistically right but increasingly they are that we are transactional instead of relational again read these new york times things that one of them was a an op-ed saying even if you never get divorced you should basically have a divorce agreement with your husband so that everything is very neat and 50 50 and schedule that so you're never fighting over who should do what <laughs> and so that is letting the logic of capitalism seep into a marriage now some people might object to my terms because people get really defensive about capitalism so mm -hmm. that's that's why you started with the preface and they I'm, also I'm, get defensive about a divorce family and parenthood so you're like in a big <laughs> yeah. minefield here dude but go ahead <laughs> but so but so that logic of capitalism doesn't allow for sort of lifelong commitment that and a lack of kind of uh accounting and and scorekeeping that comes with marriage and family formation so that's one part of the problem is that if if capitalism goes from being an economic system and i say this to my libertarian friends if your libertarianism goes from being telling Congress what to do to telling people how to live their life, we're definitely not going to uh, uh, find very much agreement at all. And if capitalism goes from being an economic system to an approach to life, it, it fails. So does the logic of capitalism necessarily e expand? No, because what acts as checks on that is, again, going to be civil society. And so that has always been sort of a a uh, a rampart against capitalism creeping too far and democracy too both of both democracy and capitalism are checked by civil society i think this is basic you could take this directly from tocqueville if you wanted to that the reason they go hand in hand is they balance each other beautifully and they allow for the multiple identities that you're talking about that you get to sort of define yourself by your religious community, your local pub, your uh, the your work community, your your neighborhood, etc. Um, but on the on the point of does material let me the the optionality in a lot of ways choosing is having a lot of choices is actually harmful. So remember mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders uh, sort of knocked the idea that there's 19 different kinds of deodorant in the store. Right. This is actually sort of a complaint I've had too, although I'm very particular. I'm anti-anti-perspirant. People sometimes <laughs> call me anti-anti-Trump, which I don't think is true, but I'm definitely anti-anti-perspirant, just a straight up deodorant. But when I go to the grocery store to try to buy something you know, my wife normally does the shopping. I, I hate all those choices. When I make my kids breakfast, if I give them options, if I give them more than one option, they're unhappy. So mm -hmm. just cheese or no on the breakfast sandwich. So that that's the right number of choices. <clears throat> I quote Stephanie Murray and a couple other um, sort of left of center or far left women talking about how once parenthood became sort of exquisitely chosen, we mm -hmm. postpone it, we agonize it, we choose it. It's part of intentional living rather than it's kind of what you do. You could opt out of it, but you grow up, you get married, you have kids. It's sort of what you do. Once it went from sort of what you do to you alone, the two of you chose right. this after intense deliberation, A, it, it, the burden of it, you have to do yeah. it right. B, the social support for it declined because well, this is your problem. Joan, if yeah. you had a boat and it kept giving you problems, I would try to help you once in a while. But eventually I'd be like, Jonah, you chose to buy a boat, okay? Right. You knew right. it was going to be a headache. This is the response parents get. You chose to have a kid. So your kid's annoying me on the plane. When you chose to have a kid, you chose to not get to fly and see grandma. That's the sort of responses we get. That's the wrong approach. 
I'm more in favor of the sort of Israeli approach of like, mm -hmm. kids are naturally part of life. It's like bringing your left arm on a plane. And so that's one of the ways in which the, the choosing and the choice gets in our way, in addition to the way that Lyman's talking about. But it, it seeps into our, our, our sort of our psyche as a, as a culture. And we say, it, it, it's your choice. It's your problem. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great point. This once you turn marriage and parenthood into this bespoke, you know, uh, thing that is supposed to be manicured for Instagram, <laughs> rather than you know what you do, you get this. Um, it it feels like a much much heavier lift, and it's funny you bring this up. Like, so my wife is writing a biography of her dad and she grew up with nine, one of nine in Fairbanks, Alaska. And every kid was allowed to have one food that they wouldn't eat. Like <laughs> if, if, if you, that. that's it. Like, so like if you hated tomatoes and mushrooms, pick the one you hate more <laughs> because you are not allowed to complain about the other one. And uh, he would throw, uh, he would th go into a rage uh, if you tried to bring more than one kind of salad dressing to the table. And this was a guy with a master's degree from Milton Friedman of the University of Chicago, an unapologetic capitalist, but the little platoon of the family worked under different rules. And so it's funny, like this is a remnant bingo card point here because I bring it up all the time, but this is Hayek's point about the microcosm and the macrocosm is that you cannot bring the values of the contractual market order into the family or you'll destroy the family or the free association or the church or whatever, all these communities yeah. that work on different levels. But you also can't bring, and this is the point that a lot of our friends on the nationalist and integralist right miss is you also can't bring the values of the family or the tribe or the church and impose them on the extended order of Liberty. Cause you'll ruin that. You got to <laughs> keep the peanut butter of Gemeinschaft out of the chocolate of Gesellschaft period. And I mean, there can be a little overlap, but it can't yeah. be. Um, and, and I think that this is one of the things your point about the sort of inter the culture of capitalism getting into the groundwater, the, the present the, 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 the priorities of capitalism getting into the groundwater of family and community culture, I think, is 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 a really good one. And that's a big part of the problem. But I, I think, yeah, we should we should go further down this road, because what I the sort of middle-ish road I try to walk here is it's middle between sort of a, a pluralism and an all-consuming small L liberalism on the one side and a very prescriptivist, you know, integralism or whatever mm -hmm. on the other side. And a lot of people think pluralism, liberalism is the middle road. And I, I understand that argument, but I would say we shouldn't necessarily be neutral at every level on um, the question of family. So for instance, the, the easiest thing is there are some things that the government is doing and will be doing for the foreseeable future, such as building infrastructure. The infrastructure should be more pro-family than it is. There should yeah, be- okay, This is a fair point. I, I, if I more, sounded like I disagree with this, I- Yeah, no, I, no, no, no. I, I'm, 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 I'm starting with the easy part, the part yeah, you're yeah, definitely yeah. gonna agree with, but that the infrastructure should be more pro-family than it is. More right. sidewalks. There's not a sidewalk in front of my house. It's a super wide street, which is great for cars. Right. So you realize now there's trade-offs. And there was a, a neighborhood near me where they were talking about putting in a sidewalk and Montgomery County, Maryland folks said, oh, well, this will kill trees. And somebody said, well, it might kill my kid to have to walk in right. the street to school. And the response is, your children shouldn't be walking to school alone anyway. And so you suddenly see there is this clash of values. You can't be right. neutral. You have to choose between trees and children. I don't think it's a tough choice. We should take that side. So that's where government is going to be involved. And I wrote in the Wall Street Journal an op-ed saying, as long as we have an income tax code, there should be a child tax credit, not a massive one, not a tiny one, a little bigger than what we have. Taxes, uh, sidewalks, et cetera. Then I would say institutions feel a pressure to be low. So employers, for instance, some employers got blowback when they expanded their maternity and paternity leave. People said, what about my puppy? Mm -hmm. What about, and I realized at one point we had, I had one colleague who said, well, what about the fact, you know, when Seth Mandel was at the Washington Examiner. And so I was doing T-ball. Seth was getting off Friday to make sure he was home by sundown and all of this stuff. And somebody said, I don't have a religion or kids. 
so I don't get these accommodations. And I thought, when, when you got, when you had a cat, we let you mm-hmm. take four days off because your your vet said to stay with the cat <laughs> for four days. And when Arsenal or whatever was in the Premier League finals, we let you go and drink at the bar at 10 a.m. And, and be drunk all day on a Thursday. And so you get a little accommodation. We get more because mm-hmm. faith and family are more important. So an employer, uh, a community institution, these other things should be pro-family, especially when we have birth rates at 1.7 and uh, the median, uh, I mean, the mean uh, desired optimal family is 2.7. We're falling short on something really important. So we should actually take sides of, of being pro-family, but not to the degree that we're trying to um, prescribe one way of life, but that we're sort of recognizing this is the natural course of events. We're going to accommodate it at times to the detriment of other things. Cars will suffer in favor of kids. Um, dog owners might suffer in favor of parents. Yeah, and look, in the, in the dog owners, as you know, I am a proud dog owner. I have two um, as well. Uh, so be it, right? I mean, like, to yeah. me, these are not, you know, very difficult um, questions. Um, uh, at the level that you're sort of proposing them. I mean, um, and I agree that the state has, the state in the liberal, even libertarian paradigm, right? The, the sort of, the, the limited government mm-hmm. version of the state still has skin in the game on this question. And, um, because it should be future oriented, not just right. present oriented. So being pro kid is future oriented. And um and you don't have to have the sort of metaphysical spiritual leveling that requires that would allow you to say, well, all choices are equal, therefore choosing to have a kid is no different than choosing to have a bunch of dogs or um a garden or you know or or a weird hobby, right? Because, like, having kids is not a weird hobby. And it doesn't mean there's anything... It's not, I mean, that line was in my book. That was <laughs> doesn't mean there's anything wrong with weird hobbies. I love people with weird hobbies. But, like, it's not the same thing as, like, raising the, the, the citizens of, a, of the... and the future inheritors of your civilization, right? And so, like, yeah. you can be reasonable about these things. At the same time, like, you know, my old boss was Ben Wattenberg. He wrote a book called The Birth Dearth that was attacked viciously by a lot of people for a long time. It was one of the first pro-natalists, which mm-hmm. means increasing the fertility rate thing. Uh, one of the first pro-natalist books in the 1970s. He used to debate Paul Ehrlich. Um, and um, it turns out that just like the actual nuts and bolts of encouraging people to have more babies is a very thorny and difficult public policy thing, right? So, like, yes, what, what, how do you think about that? How do you sell people on the idea of it? Um, presumably, there's no coercion involved, but like, what, um, what do you think actually works? You've looked at this literature a yeah. lot more recently than I have, and every time I look, I dive into it, it looks like the hungry stuff is there's not, it's not, there's nothing there. But there's less there than some of the people who claim yes. it's like this silver bullet, right? So if yeah, if you listen to what Hungary and their best friends in the U.S. say, you would think that Hungary has a baby boom going on right now. It doesn't. It's slowed and halted its falling birth rate, but about the same as its next door neighbors who haven't done, invested as much. And if you so. There's, there's no, like, clear, controlled study of how this stuff works. So all we have is observations. Look at states, look at countries, look at time, compare them. And so all we can do is come up with the, an impression. And the impression I come up with, and I think if you asked other demographers who weren't biased, if you asked Lyman Stone, for instance, uh, I think he'd agree with 80% of what I'm about to say. If you want to spend lots of money to boost the birth rate, you can do that, but it's super expensive and it'll only get you so far. 
-hmm. and that the way to do that is mostly just to give large piles of money to parents. <laughs> right. Certainly don't subsidize daycare. Subsidizing daycare is subsidizing work. It's subsidizing one specific way of life. And it's, I mean, that's what sort of an evil chamber of commerce pretending to be pronatalist would advocate. It's just subsidize, turn mothers into company men and keep company men as they were. But if you get, so France is a, a, a telling example because they have the highest birth rate in Europe and it's not just immigration. 1.8 is a birth rate of native born French. They spend so much money. You get check when your baby is born. You get a child allowance. On top of that, you get a, a maternity leave, paternity leave. That's basically a stay at home mom benefit. If it's your third kid, you get three years mm -hmm. of being paid to be a stay at home mom. And that works because it's a ton of money. I think that subsidizing stay-at-home moms can actually change the culture in a pro-family way. And changing mm -hmm. the culture is what you have to do. I also think it's, it's just, it eats up a huge portion of their economy. And it doesn't have, they're not even close to where Israel is. And Israel has a far skimpier spending. Mm -hmm. One of the problems, and this is a, a sort of AEI thing that we get into sort of internally is, you're also discouraging work, which is not always bad. If it's a married couple and discouraging work means now there's a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, I think that's great. But also you can be discouraging marriage, and that is bad. So this is why I actually partway through the book stopped saying pro-natalist and mm -hmm. just started saying pro-family. Because I don't want a big subsidy. I, I want to help single mothers as much as possible. But if our subsidy programs are discouraging marriage then mm -hmm. that can be harming the kids and in the long run not necessarily help these women who might want three kids get three kids because it's discouraging them from getting married so all of that is tied up and i would just say what we're doing in the u.s might be the right thing to do on the federal level uh money wise and if you if you ramped it up a little bit the child tax credit um expanded it to age 18 right now when your child's 16 you're going to lose the tax credit and it's they allow people to claim some of it earlier make sure you adjust it for inflation these are the small expansions that i would do almost as fairness measures but most of the work by government is going to have to be done you're going to have to ask a question are you making the culture more family friendly and money generally doesn't do that. And a central government in a country the size of the U.S. generally can't do that. Um, it's funny. I recently had um, our colleague Brad Wilcox on to talk about his book about marriage. And it chunks of it, we had to sort of, or at least I had to sort of fight the temptation to just say, isn't a big part of the problem that men suck. <laughs> and um um and there is a there is a like because you look at a lot of the studies on this and it's like um women still want to a lot of women blue collar working class women non college educated women they want to get married they would like to be married mm -hmm. um but the the men available to them are not men I can almost stop the sentence there. They're not yeah. men. You know, they're boys. Um and what they don't want is to have particularly if they already have kids, right? These single moms, what they don't want is just another dependent that they're taking care of. They want a responsible partner to help with parenting, you know, to do the division of labor stuff that you talk about a lot in the book that um, is sort of essential to parenting. Um, and, and so in some ways, isn't part of the problem, you're right about, the, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with you about the, the problem with the sort of feminism that says make women into company men, but isn't part of also the cultural problem that men don't want to be men? They don't want to be responsible. I, I mean, men, mm -hmm. I mean, menches, right? I mean, I mean, yeah. the idea of being responsible people who um, subordinate their desires for instant gratification and self-indulgence to um, 
as you were saying earlier, as basically answering to women, because that's a big part of like being a good dad <laughs> is is following orders. I mean, I, I say that unapologetically. Um, yeah. so, and and the uh, if you see wedding crashers, they make fun of the the two readings that are in all uh, mm -hmm. Christian writings. It's either Corinthians or Ephesians, and the Ephesians reading if it's sometimes notorious because it says women subordinate yourselves to men, but it actually starts a verse before is husbands and wives subordinate yourselves to one another, mm -hmm. which uh, I, I studied Greek and I love that idea of subordinate, which literally rank yourself below. Right. So husband says wife, number one, I'm number two. The woman says, uh, husband, number one, uh, I, I'm number two. And so that idea, which is sort of this logical impossibility, you can't both be number two, et cetera. I mean, that, that to me is a great expression of marriage. And it's, it's in some conservative manosphere type circles that that's totally rejected. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christine Emba, she wrote a, a really good book, I think it was two years ago now, called uh, Rethinking Sex. And she wrote another piece, uh, I forget where it ran i think oh big washington post like cover piece weekend magazine or whatever saying like we need a better model of of masculinity and that's because the the idea that all masculinity is toxic causes this blowback which is andrew tateism but then even a, a subtler one that's easier to notice if like me you sort of dwell in conservative catholic circles which is oh well men aren't getting married because you know, women don't care enough to to give up their careers. And then I'm going to, one guy even said to me, if I marry a girl who has a master's degree, I'm going to be paying off her student loan for this worthless thing for life. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> hey, it's not worthless. Okay. And education, if she, even if she's a stay at home mom has yeah. value, but be like, yes, man up, pay off right. her student debt. Right. Um, but so that, that uh, trickles in. And then you have Donald Trump saying how embarrassed he is when he sees men pushing strollers down the street or finds out that men change diapers. And so that's why I, I really liked Christine Emma's argument. And it's one of the things I, I try to take up in the book. Oh, I talk about destroying my kids at basketball is like a, a real sacrifice for your family that's masculine in tone. Now, if we're if we get invaded by a Viking horde, then it's easy to know what the sacrifice is. You know, you're going to mm -hmm. go out there and you're going to fight the war. And this is what men in Ukraine are facing. This is what uh, all, all throughout history men have faced. And if we don't have that, a, a manly kind of sacrifice for the family uh, is, is something that isn't articulated enough by a, a left that wants to erase differences between men and women and then some of these manosphere circles that thinks the whole is this sort of resentful idea that mm. we don't sort of naturally have dominance over the home, that that should just be handed to us, that we're going to be in charge as if it's not something you have to earn through sacrifice. Yeah, it's, I, I push back a little bit about this thing about how it's in this impossible ideal to subordinate yourself to each other. Um, I'm not sure that's true, right? Maybe we were talking before about sort of multiple identity stuff. Um, back when, particularly when the division of labor about running a household was much more onerous, right? Um, the idea that the sphere, and I'm not saying it's the natural sphere that women have to have this role. I'm just saying that like, you know, there are areas of life where I, I would say most areas of life where I defer to my wife. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are others where much fewer <laughs> where she <laughs> defers to me. And I think a lot of happy marriages have, I, I shouldn't say happy marriage, a lot of happy marriages, but also just a lot of successful marriages, which are not always the exact same thing. Um, uh, there is this notion of spheres of authority where in some contexts you're a follower and in some contexts you're a leader. And I think that's yep. true in a lot of relationships. You know, it's like, you know, I, I, I despise uh, using this analogy in ways that will haunt me for the rest of my life. But, uh, you know, Steve Hayes and I, we have a division of labor about the dispatch. And 
there are areas where he follows my lead and there are areas where I follow his lead. Um, I'm not married to Steve. Hayes. <laughs> but uh, I think most good relationships, not just dual, you know, binary relationships, but like multiple relationships, they kind of have these understandings, like a good military platoon. Yep. There are just some issues where the sergeant or the lieutenant is going to say, you know, you know, Baker knows more about, you know, combat engineering. So we're all going to defer to him on this thing, that kind of thing. Um, and deference and, and surrender, though, cut against that that idea right. of uh, of sort of the, the human as a ultimately 100 percent intellectual creature who's going to choose everything when when you go along and so i use the word surrender in the book because that's what my mother-in-law said she said mm -hmm. marriage is about surrender mm -hmm. um and so i tell i tell the story of unpacking the boxes of the gifts we had registered for we in quotes the gifts we had registered for when we were engaged and i open up this one box and it was our drinking glasses and the tops of which your favorite were, glasses <laughs> the tops of which <laughs> were square okay uh -huh. now it's not just that i don't like the aesthetic of it i actually have an opinion that round of a certain range of diameter properly mm -hmm. fits the human mouth i'm the kind of guy who's thought about those sort of things <laughs> and so i just shouted and so my brother had moved out we weren't yet married i was living in this empty apartment by myself just filled with these boxes and i shout i whine very loudly I do not want to drink out of square glasses. And then my mother-in-law, my future mother-in-law's word comes into mind. Just surrender. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will drink out of square glasses. One of the blessings of having six kids is everything gets destroyed and broken. So all the square glasses are gone now, 18 years into our wedding. They all Finally. have top, they all have top uh, round tops. But then as I was writing that passage, I looked up at the wall where in our living room, the Bailey's Irish cream mirror was hanging and it has, it's a map of Ireland with every County and then all the last names and, and what parts of Ireland they come from. And I thought my wife did not say, I want to have a Bailey's <laughs> Irish cream mirror hanging from my wall. She surrendered on this one thing when I hung it on a St. Patrick's day and then said the next day, can we just leave it up? And that was not me convincing her <laughs> that it looked beautiful. Right. This was her saying, okay, this will make my husband happy. And it's inoffensive enough. Um, all right, you know, we, we, I, you made me feel guilty about skipping past all the sports league stuff and all of that <laughs> kind of thing. Um, talk about the the little things. I mean, we don't have to get into the public policy. Talk about the little things that people actually have control over mm -hmm. in their own lives, whether they're single or they're married, whether they have kids, whether they don't that you think could be, could let, you know, uh, I'm not a huge fan of the phrase, but life hacks, right? Like, yeah, like I actually, it, I, I use that term, but I, I blame it on my kids that I'm using that term. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I, I, I've surrendered to the term, but like, you know, the little, the, the little tricks that make life your own life, that you have some agency and control over that make life a little more family friendly. So I guess a, a mindset would be, uh, when you're asking what the best of something is, so the best uh, music teacher, the best school, the best baseball league, it should always, the, the primary consideration should be about how it works with family culture, which often is just going to mean convenience of logistics. Mm -hmm. So there is this, so I do talk about over ambitious youth sports and how it leads to kids burning out and how it leads it makes kids less happy. How you end up in a lacrosse tournament in Delaware every other weekend and it disrupts the family. And one of these programs that I, I've come in contact with is called Next Level Lacrosse. So they're mm -hmm. nine year olds who are trying to get to the next level. And and some of the dads say, I wish lacrosse didn't control my family calendar. And so I say, instead of next level lacrosse, it should be next door lacrosse what is the lacrosse mm -hmm. program that my kid can walk to or that's right after school and that's it's just a mindset where you make a slightly different decision if the first question is how does this play into my family and then just remind yourself even if you put your kid in next level lacrosse for eight years some other kid is going to come by and be like you know what let me try lacrosse and he's going to be more athletic and he's going to take your kid's starting job so let that be your consolation if you're thinking, oh, he's getting second tier coaching because it's just from some, you know, recent high school grad or some volunteer dad or something. Just 
the other thing isn't going to work. It's going to make him hate lacrosse or it's, he's going to lose his starting job. But again, the, the general mindset is just start from how does this work for the family? And what we were talking about earlier, a lot of times your kids are happier if you limit the number of choices they have. Mm-hmm. Often you give them a choice, again, cheese or no cheese. When we go to the zoo, I say, okay, everybody pick one animal, and I guarantee <laughs> you we will see that one animal. We'll see other animals, but I'm not going to – if you say after we see the sea lions, oh, I desperately want to see the uh, Prashinsky's donkey – no, mm-hmm. we're not going to see the Prochinsky's donkey because it's out of the way and you got to pick the sea lions. And that's an overrated donkey. I'm just going to tell you right now. Anyway. <laughs> that, that's your anti-Polish bias. <laughs> I actually don't remember if it's called the Prochinsky's donkey. I, it's I just got know some Polish some name. I remember. Polish yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Um, and so limiting choices and just putting family culture ahead of what seems like the more elite or the more prestigious or even the more effective program. Um. So another area where I have some sympathy with the, the, the critics of capitalism and meritocracy, uh, and I'm putting air quotes around meritocracy because it's a content, contentious mm-hmm. and contested term. Um, I really believe in merit. I just want to be clear. But like meritocracy is a kind of more complicated yeah. term. Isn't a big part of the problem. So you, you can sort of do the grease board arrow causal pointing thing, right? Where to the extent the we'll just say for shorthand bad values of elites trickle down to non-elites um isn't one of the drivers of the bad values of elites inconvenient values of elites right Mm -hmm. counterproductive values is uh what elite colleges demand from parents in terms of their kids right so like the away sports stuff the travel sports stuff in my experience with my daughter like that really is a function of universe elite universities which people in my neighborhood my kids mm-hmm. schools obsessed with you know uh, for reasons that my wife and i are to the degree that my wife and i utterly reject but it's we can't protect her from like we yep. once got yelled at by my daughter because she was like all my friends already ha- have had an SAT tutor for a year. Why haven't you gotten us an SAT tutor yet? <laughs> gotten me an SAT tutor? And it's like, Jesus. You know, I, anyway, I, I, this stuff drives me crazy. But the compulsion to get a sport that can get you into a college program is um, an elite college um, mm-hmm. is really profound. And the actual benefits of going to these elite schools, in terms of the traditional benefits of like, a good education, that's a contestable point. Yep. But the, the sort of sheepskin effect and network effect of going to these schools is remains as valuable as ever. So like, well, isn't so a big part is, of this changing this culture, doing something about all that? Exactly. And so this is why when I first thought, okay, if people are having this few babies and kids are stressed, like let's write a, a, a book about the problem. And then I realized I don't want to come across as just – finger wagging at parents that are doing it wrong. And so that's why, the, the, you know, it's a family unfriendly culture. The subtitle is our culture makes it harder. Institutions that set the culture, which includes high schools, but also these colleges, they are setting up a framework where a parent has to really opt out. <laughs> a parent has to make uh be countercultural and and make a decision that you're afraid. Of, okay, is this going to harm my child's career chances to to do the right thing? That's why when I talk about travel sports, I call it a trap. You you get funneled into. It. I just want my son to play JV baseball. Well, if you mm-hmm. want to try out for JV, you better play your route. Um, and on the on the college level, absolutely the insane extracurricular thing, and then that gets that gets gamed, and so we have to and our our daughter's high school at least sort of pushes back and says so we ended up doing non-ap regular european history because the teacher said she's going to learn more and have more fun in that now we're Mm -hmm. doing ap u.s history and that might actually been a mistake and i don't know ask me 10 years from now if if you're putting my daughter on a whether ap was a mistake or non-ap was a mistake 
I did tell her, though, to uh, make herself the vice president of the French club. She doesn't speak French, but she, the, her best friend started the French club. And Lucy's job was to serve the crepes and, and advance the slideshow that the, the French girl was doing. And so that's the one resume booster. It's just whatever you're already doing because it's fun, just get a good title for it. That's, that's yeah. the, <laughs> the college transcript. But yeah, so the parents are given bad incentives. So to go back to selfishness, which I mentioned in the beginning. I argue selfishness has not increased. My sort of AEI chart of selfishness, which is zero, Adam and Eve eat the fruit, it goes up to 100, it's been flat since then. <laughs> but the job of civilization is to combat, to offset selfishness, to redirect the, the self-interest towards the common good. And so I think that we are failing at that. And so this is where civil society and institutions are supposed to do that work. and. We do it better than most other countries. I mean, go to Iraq, go to even mm -hmm. some of the uh, Mediterranean European states. The selfishness is more, it's running rampant. It's less checked by society. But I do think that for all the reasons we've talked about earlier, the U.S. culture, American culture is, is inadequately checking that. And the, the selflessness it takes to get married, have kids, immerse yourself in a community even though that redounds to the private benefit naturally in the long, it takes a long term to do that. So that's a failure of our culture, including the institutions that you're talking about, the elite universities. Yeah. It's, it's funny. just going back to my point about Hayek's microcosm and macrocosm. One of the, when you talk about how other societies are more selfish, um, one of the best examples of how, this confusion, right? So like the, the unconstrained vision, whatever we're going to call progressives or communists or socialists or whatever, right? That, that tribe, which I think the nationalists have a similar psychological approach to these things, but we can talk about that another time. Um, what they want is a less selfish society. And they think that the state should be the engine mm -hmm. of enforcing that uh, less that 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 more social solidarity, and the great irony, which I think people like us have not been successful enough at explaining to people, is those societies that are based on those well-intentioned premises to a certain extent. We can take out the bad parts, but like you know, say what take you about the, communism, the... <laughs> right? But like yeah. communism actually creates more selfish people. Yes. And that's the weird, that's what, when you try to run the macrocosm like it's a microcosm, like it's just one big family, mm -hmm. the reality of facts on the ground is that you create this alienated society where no one feels like they're, par they're all in it together. They all feel like they're all in it for themselves. And that's the great weird irony of free societies is that it provides opportunities to feel like you're actually part of something. And it seems to me a part of your argument is that we're falling down on the job of providing those kinds of institutions to let people feel like they're part of well, something. Yeah, because a, if, if all you had was a liberal, pluralistic democracy, then you wouldn't have any solidarity. If you have a liberal, pluralistic democracy that's populated by robust institutions of civil society, which will, in, as microcosms, be less liberal, less pluralistic, but they're freely chosen, even if they're a little sticky mm -hmm. or they're inherited, but you could still leave them. Um, then it, uh, that, that I have always seen civil society as, as a check on liberalism, which is a funny thing to say, because we think they go together because Tocqueville says this democracy, but then you realize what Tocqueville's saying that our, our love of egalitarianism and democracy will actually lead us to become more isolated and, and, right. and centralized the state. And so they go naturally together in part because they're different and because they're needed as a check on one another. And the, the family can be seen as almost a, an early indicator uh, a canary in the coal mine. David Brooks uh, wrote a piece with the, the, the title, The Nuclear Family Was a Mistake, which is obviously a provocative way of saying the nuclear family needs support from community. But we've built a life that's good for individuals and bad for families, or good for, you know, really high achieving adults and bad for children. 
And I think that that's basically true. And it can almost be, again, seen as an early indicator of the sickness of our society. So in some ways, Family Unfriendly is a sequel to Alienated America. The biggest mm -hmm. story of the last 60 years is the collapse of civil society in the U.S. The most important consequence of that, and so the biggest story of the next 60 years, is the reduction in marriage and family formation and the, the shrinking population of young people in the United States. Yeah, I mean, the way I think about it, and that's why I, I was trying to steer you into the connection between the last book, which was great. The um, way I kind of sometimes think about it is, is that society is this big Rube Goldberg, no relation, machine, <laughs> right? With all these weird things, doing these weird things towards certain social ends. And at the center of it is this hamster wheel that drives the whole, that powers the whole thing. And that's the family. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is a point that really got hammered home with me with Charles Murray's, you know, coming apart was that you look at civil society, you look at the institutions of civil society, and I mean, you're kind of an exception. Basically, every food can drive, you know, uh, block party, uh, you know, movie night at a church or mm -hmm. a synagogue, whatever scratch the surface and you get this Pareto distribution where it's like a handful of really impressive women who mm -hmm. are calling the shots and telling their husbands what to do. And, yes. um, and that's, you know, like, and this is the point about like little league coaches, you know, or the T-ball coaches and all that kind of stuff. Very few single men do that kind of thing. Because single men don't have wives telling them what to do and like to be part of a community. And, um, and so if you lose the fam, if you lose the hamster wheel, it's very difficult for all of these different, so, you know, subordinate institutions at the end of the day, they start to come apart as well. And that's yep. the connection I kind of see between the two books. Well, and it's why I have, um, and to go even further, it's why I have a chapter, it's called quit your job. Um, but it's, I praise my wife, who's a stay-at-home mom, and all the things she does that benefit her friends, neighbors, these institutions that we belong to that she's able to do because she's at home full-time. So, you know, she reads to the kindergarten classroom when somebody's sick. Uh, <laughs> there was one day where we got a call, and it was, you know, the first grader, the, a friend of our first grader, had wet herself. And so the call comes in and says, do you guys have a spare pair of underwear and leggings to bring down mm -hmm. to St. John's to drop off? All those little things. And then I found Emma Green at The Atlantic had written a whole history of how women being outside of the paid workforce was absolutely essential to American history mm -hmm. and um, to the abolition cause, to the women's suffrage cause, uh, for better or for worse, to the temperance movement. Etc. But that that has always been at the heart of it. And then to so a chapter praising stay at home moms is is one of the things I'm hoping is going to you know catch some attention because you don't see it a lot. But also just more generally to go back to alienated America, one of the things that just the norm of marriage does and is make it easier for there to be people involved in the community that partly because women tell them to, partly because the flexibility that marriage buys you in, in all sorts of ways. And yeah, so married couples are more involved in the community. And that being unmarried, you're just, it's harder to be selfless and to care about the common good. Mm -hmm. so one way I talk about it is I spend the whole book, you know, let's pull out of travel sports, let's not helicopter, let's have more sidewalks. Parenting can be easier if we do these things right. And I said, it's going to be the hardest thing you ever do if you do it. Mm -hmm. But it's the easiest path if where you're trying to get is lofty enough. If you want to be a man or a woman of virtue, parenting is like a cheat code. Mm -hmm. If you, if it's the easiest in Catholic terms, I think marriage and parenthood are the easiest path to sainthood. Not the only one, but they make it easier for us. So the mm -hmm. Bible says, feed the hungry, clothe the naked. 
I wake up in the morning, there are hungry naked people in my house. They're, <laughs> they're right there waiting for me. And so that idea that when one of the things Charles got in trouble for, with when he wrote Coming Apart was he said, there are virtues that are lacking in the working class. And mm -hmm. so then some liberal populists were like, you're, you're attacking the liberal class as being full of vice. I reframed it a little. And I said, the idleness that Murray talks about is an affliction. It's, it's not just a vice. It's, it's something that's, that they're suffering through that. I'm not, my lack of idleness is not because I'm, you know, a great guy who's just constantly saying, how can I help my community? It's because I belong to all these things that are fun. And then somebody comes up to you <laughs> and you can see the look in their eyes and, you know, Hey, Tim, I see Meg is signed up for basketball. Yeah. We have enough girls from the parish to run a team. That's great. We need a coach. All right. Good luck on finding Tim. I'm hoping you can cut. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm too busy this year. I'm writing a book. What, what's the book about? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so then I become the kindergarten girls basketball coach. Right. <laughs> and so the community and family rope us in to doing stuff. That's kind of selfless and makes the world better. So why should we care about the baby bus? That's what, you know, I get asked by the, the more friendly liberal feminists on Twitter who are kind of like, I don't think you're a, uh, a, a what's the uh, Margaret At Atwood book? Um, Brides, uh, no. Hand Handmaid, Handmaid's, Handmaid's Tale. Tale. Not yeah. Brideshead's Tale. No, Handmaid's Different. Tale. <laughs> I don't think you're a Handmaid's Tale guy. Why are you worrying about the fact that women are, you know, now have autonomy and aren't having babies? And it's because family makes people better. Yeah. Babies make us happier. Yeah. I mean, this, this is like the... I think it's the sort of the, I don't even want to call it conservative because then it, it alienates yeah. people who, whatever, but like it is the, it is the essence of wisdom. And when it comes to sort of the political, cultural understanding of things, I mean, um, Russ Roberts, um, uh, his last book, Wild Problems, gets at some of this. And one of the things I love about Russ is, first of all, he's brilliant. He's a great guy. I love his podcast. Um, he's kind of a recovering economist. And he's realizing that eco economics, particularly free market economics, is fantastic for the things that free mm -hmm. market economics is fantastic for and utterly useless for the <laughs> things that it is not well suited for. And, and part of his point about wild problems is that some problems, some choices, you can only realize they're the right choice after you take the leap of faith after you make the commitment, right? And parenthood and marriage make you a better person. And you can't see it from this side of the ravine because mm -hmm. all you're seeing is the dirty diapers and the late nights and the lack of Saturday night fun and all that kind of stuff. And what you're not seeing is that you become other directed and you become, uh, you subordinate yourself to the needs of others, which we now know is one of the only routes to actual life satisfaction and happiness. And um, a public policy that takes that into account. Autonomy, liberty is great. Autonomy is not the same thing. And autonomy is not necessarily entirely good. Um, but, you know, who's going to listen to me? So how, how much, <laughs> so just to close this out, has has the blowback begun from the sort of harder core feminists or is it not a thing I, yet? I have not yet been blessed with being attacked by the harder core feminists. In fact, Michelle Goldberg um, just said, let's just say, you know, liberal columnist of the New York Times. She says, let's just say Tim Kearney's a, a Catholic dad of six uh, and he's a conservative. So I obviously don't agree with him on most of it, but I do think if you want to tear kids away from their cell phones, you need playgrounds and, and sidewalks. Um, but the, uh, the stay at home mom chapters and, uh, and the stuff that questions the effect of birth control on our culture. Those are the later chapters. So I'm mm -hmm. hoping people will get to those over the, over the weekend and, and I'll start getting attacked on, on Monday or Tuesday. No, well, if I've helped in that regard in any way, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad for it. Um, Tim Carney, the book is family unfriendly, how our culture made raising kids much harder than it needs to be. Thanks for being on the remnant. Thank you.